A little more now with Mark Bailey, who joins us live from Fig Securities. Mark, if we look at the market reaction, uh, those treasuries, those yields relatively unchanged, the US dollar seems to be faltering at the moment. Uh, investors a little bit confused about the outlook for, for rate hikes this year. Yeah, good morning, Lee. And I, and I guess it kind of boils, you know, boils back down to you know whether that CPI prints that we have had for the last couple of months you know, is kind of transitory, which is what the Fed was keen to highlight in its commentary. You know that uh, you know, it does expect inflation to be low that 2% target for you know the next uh, 18 months or so before kind of rising above that and there's that big debate and you know that what those um, regional fed presidents comments do highlight is that kind of split that you do have on the FOMC between those that think that inflation is transitory the low inflation is transitory and those that think it's actually you know weak data that will potentially persist and therefore you don't need to have the hikes and i think at the moment the market is certainly in the camp where it's believing that the fed will not have to hike as maybe as rapidly as expected, maybe not in 2017, but in 2018 and beyond. You know, it probably doesn't see those three or four hikes coming through that the, the blue dot plots do suggest. And I think it's a much more kind of dovish outlook. And I think you're seeing that in terms of, you know, Treasury yields at the moment. You know, at the moment, uh, you know, uh, on Friday, the 10-year U.S. Treasury fell one basis point to 214 percent. And that is it at the low point of the range that we've been trading in the last six months. So I think the market is certainly positioned for a fairly dovish outlook from the Fed. It believes that probably the CPI data, despite you know the tightening labour market, and let's not forget that unemployment did fall again uh, last month and is projected to continue to fall, but we're not seeing any kind of wage price inflation coming through or inflation in terms of the CPI, and that is what is causing some regional Fed presidents to say we can take a pause and maybe delay some of the future hikes until we see some strength in the data. John Williams, President, CEO, Fed. Um, of San Francisco Fed President here speaking tomorrow. Um, is it a market mover, do you think? What would you be expecting to hear him say as it relates to uh, the Fed and uh, its cause for, for hikes? I, I think he'll you know, be pretty um, keep his cards close to his chest. I don't think it'll be a, a big mover. Again, I think you know, it's, it's that classic debate that you know, the future uh, rate hikes are always data dependent, as Yellen does continue to point out. Uh, I think he'll probably continue to, to push his point of view a bit further in terms of the data. I mean, obviously, Neil Kashkari was the only one that dissented in terms of the hikes. Um, I don't think um, you know, Williams will do that, do that. And again, you know, it would be probably focusing around the inflation targets and the inflation data that has been soft and whether that is likely to continue, you know, as the comments have been over the weekend from the uh, two other regional Fed presidents. Um, we have an interesting chart here just on that US inflation. It's, it's hit the Fed's goal only one um, in one month since 2012, I believe. So I guess raising concerns that it's headed for a potential mistake there. But um, as you were sort of pointing out there, Fed Chair Janet Yellen, she remains confident, I suppose, at the, uh, the strong labour market that will rejuvenate those price pressures. That, that, that's right, and you know, it, it, geez, you are seeing conflicting sides. You know, strength in the labour market. You know, the other data out, outside the CPI has also been a bit weak, and we saw that again on, on Friday, actually, in terms of the uh, market uh, PMIs, both the manufacturing and services PMIs, both came under uh, under expectations below consensus. And, you know, if you look at industrial production capacity utilisation, that's been soft as well, which also leads to a kind of a weaker GDP in Q2 um, expected to come through. Through. So I think the data outside the job market has become uh, a bit softer over the last couple of months, and that will be a cause for concern for those FOMC members. But having said that, you know they're still seeing strength in the labour market. But it's, the key is whether that will drive. Uh, inflation and it certainly doesn't seem to be the case at the moment and there's also the debate about whether you know the the jobs data is actually ca encapsulating what is actually really happening in the job market you know whether people are moving more to part-time are actually underemployed you know whether people are dropping out because the participation rate although it did improve last month in the in the US is still pretty low by historical standards so I think there's a lot of underemployment in the market and I think in terms of what we're actually seeing in in the job market is actually you know, maybe a bit more weakness than the headline um, unemployment rate is suggesting. Can we talk about Europe, in particular, in particular Italy, and this 17 billion euros that's been set aside to essentially buy and, and prop up some of these failing lenders? I mean, you already had such uh, an increased level of fragility when it comes to confidence in the Italian banking sector. Does this shore that up or does this add to concerns? 
In my view, James, I think it adds to the concerns, but what the key takeaway is for, I guess, investors in Australia and bond investors in Australia and hybrid investors in Australia is how they've actually gone through the insolvency process. Yeah. So it's, it's different to what happened in Spain with uh, Banco Populari. It's, it's different in that sense that they, they, they had to pass new insolvency laws over the weekend in Italy so that they could do this under national laws rather than going to the single resolution board and the uh, European Union's regu regulations. And what they've allowed them to do is allow the Italian government, as you say, to uh, have 17 billion, could be more, uh, capital to inject into those two failing banks so that uh, the second largest bank in, in, in Italy can buy them out. Um, but in terms of the bondholders, the, the equity in those two um, regional banks in, in northern Italy have been wiped out, as have the subordinated debt bondholders as well. So that's exactly the same as we've seen in the Spanish situation. However, there is some small amount of junior bondholders in the Italian banks, around about 60 million, and uh, they can claim up to around about 80% uh, recovery. And what they've said is that uh, Banco Intesa uh, can actually support that and actually make sure that they are whole. So mm. it looks like the junior retail bondholders will actually not lose any money as well, which is completely different to what we saw in Spain. So in terms of the lessons that we're getting, there doesn't seem to be a blueprint for how investors can think and, and strategize in terms of where to to invest in the capital structure. So we're still kind of no closer to getting any kind of guidance in terms of what is the actual bail-in, bail-out structure, solvency procedures in the European banks. So at the moment, it's a very, very difficult uh, situation for investors to get their heads around.